light. Light is a form of energy that causes a perception of vision. Light energy allows people and animals to see objects. But for you to see an object, light energy from the object must enter your eye and this energy is converted into a picture and interpreted in the mind. An electric filament lamp will transform electrical energy into light energy. As current flows through the filament, it becomes so hot that it begins to glow. All the objects that produce light are called luminous sources. Filament lamps, electric heaters, burning flames, the sun and all the stars are examples of luminous objects. Many objects, however, do not produce light of their own, and they are seen when light falling on them from luminous sources is reflected or bounces off their surfaces. Examples of such objects include the moon, planets, plants and many of the objects that we see on the surface of the earth and beyond. Such objects are referred to as non-luminous sources. A source of light produces pulses of energy which spread out in all directions. The path along which light energy travels is referred to as a ray of light. In diagrams, rays are represented by lines with arrows on them to show the direction of travel. On the other hand, a beam is a stream of light energy which is considered to be a bundle of rays of light. You can see beams of light in the morning as the sunlight breaks through the clouds or through the leaves. You can also see beams when a spotlight is shown in a smoky room. Also, when sunlight streams into a dark room through a small opening, beams of light can be seen easily. Now, when light strikes an object along its path, it may either go through or be blocked. Many objects do not allow light to pass through them, and such objects are said to be opaque. Translucent objects allow light to pass through them, but we cannot see clearly through them. Transparent materials allow light to pass through them, and we can see through them clearly. So let's focus on the rectilinear propagation of light. Now, unlike other forms of energy, light does not need a material medium to carry it. As a matter of fact, in an empty space or a vacuum, light travels at a speed of 300 million meters per second. Light from the sun reaches the earth having traveled through mostly a vacuum. When light from a source falls on an opaque object, it casts a shadow on the object with sharp edges behind it. Now, look at this carefully. You see the shadow cast on the ground opposite to the direction of the sun. What happens after some time when the position of the sun changes and the sun is now directly above the road, the shadow gradually disappears. Great. Let's think more about shadows. Look at this tree. This tree does not allow light rays to pass through it. Not at all. It is an opaque object. And this region that you see, which is completely cut off from the light, is the shadow. Now look at this setup. There's a bulb, and there's a cardboard with a small hole, and there's a pencil. And here you have the screen. So why do you think we have a small hole? You see, if you compare the bulb with the pencil, the bulb is way bigger. I mean, you can't call it a point source. So we allow light to pass through the small hole so that it acts as a point source. What happens is that the pencil does not allow light to pass through it, and a shadow with sharp edges is cast on the screen behind it. So as simple and common as it may seem, the formation of shadows is an evidence that light travels in a straight line. And you know a source of light which is small as a point forms a shadow which is completely devoid of light. The small hole at the end of the ray box acts as a point source and the beam illuminates the screen. 
The shadow can only form if light traveled in straight lines. If light could bend round the object, there would be no shadows. Opaque objects cast shadows of themselves when they are in the way of light. Again, we take three cardboards with holes at the same height mounted on stands. We have a candle and a matchbox. We place the cardboard pieces such that the holes are in a straight line. Now we light a candle and place it at one end of the cardboard pieces. Try and look at the candle from one end. It's only visible when the eye, the holes and the cardboard are all in a straight line. Try moving one of the cardboards off the line. The path of the light will be broken and you'll not be able to see the candle. So light travels only in a straight line. Shadows, once again, are formed when an opaque object is on the path of light. The type of shadow form depends on 1. The size of the source of light 2. The size of the opaque object and 3. The distance between the object and the source of light. If you ever carefully looked at a shadow, you might have noticed that a dark shadow is surrounded by a slightly light region. Let's observe a shadow closely. We need a bulb, a round object like a ball suspended from a support, and a white screen. We place them in a straight line, keeping a suitable distance between them, and then we switch off all the other lights. When the screen is very close to the ball, the shadow will be very sharp and we can't spot any variations. Only a dark shadow which is called the umbra. Now moving the screen away from the ball, you find that the size of the shadow increases, but the shadow is more diffused and we can see lighter regions surrounding the middle dark region. This lighter region is called the penumbra. Umbra is the region of complete shadow resulting from total obstruction of light while the penumbra is the fringe set region of partial shadow around the umbra. Eclipses An eclipse is a phenomenon of shadow formation which occurs once in a while and results in total or partial disappearance of the sun or the moon as seen from the earth. Eclipses are explained in terms of the relative positions of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. At any given moment, about half the surface of the Moon is lit by the Sun, while another half is in darkness. The lighted part is bright enough to be seen easily at night from the Earth and can also be seen at daytime. The darkened part is usually invisible, so when we look at the Moon, we therefore normally notice only the shape of the lighted portion. Now, imagine that a line is drawn from the center of the Earth to the Moon, and that a second line is drawn from the center of the Earth to the Sun. At the time of the month known as the New Moon, the angle between the two lines will be very small. The illuminated side of the Moon will be pointing directly away from the Earth, and the dark side will be pointing directly towards the Earth. We shall therefore see no Moon or a thin crescent Moon. Seven days later, the moon will be completely a quarter of its journey around the earth and the angle between the two lines will be 90 degrees. Half the illuminated side of the moon and half the darkened side will be pointing towards the earth. We then shall see what we call a half moon in the sky. This is a waxing or increasing half moon because we see more and more of the moon's illuminated face night by night. Another seven days and the angle between the two lines will be about 180 degrees. The illuminated side of the moon will now be facing directly towards the earth. The moon will then appear as a complete brilliant disk and we call this full moon. Seven days later and the angle between the two lines is about 270 degrees and we shall see half moon. 
But this is a winding half moon looking smaller night by night. Seven days later and the moon goes back to its original position where it started with the two lines close together once more. So twice a month, the moon, the sun and the earth lie in a straight line and when this happens, we are likely to connect it. If the moon happens to lie exactly between the earth and the sun so that the angle between the two lines is zero, then we experience an eclipse of the sun. But if the moon happens to lie exactly on the straight line from the sun to the earth, then we see a lunar eclipse. The eclipse of the sun or the solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes between the sun and the earth. And when this happens, the moon intercepts light from the sun, thereby casting a shadow on the earth and causing darkness during the day. The total eclipse allows us to see the sun's atmosphere which is normally not visible because of the brightness of the sun's disk itself. Red prominences of the rim of the sun's disk called the corona which normally surrounds the circumference of the moon can be seen at the same time as stars in the sky. The totality lasts not longer than 8 minutes and although the earth gets an eclipse like this every 18 months on average, each one is only viewable by less than half a percent of the world's population. Eclipse chasers will travel all over the world to put themselves in the path of that shadow. Keep in mind though that the moon has its own elliptical orbit, so its size varies about 12% throughout the month. At its closest distance, we get a total solar eclipse, but when it's farthest away, we get an annular eclipse where a ring of sunlight remains around the moon. Now, you are much more likely to experience a lunar eclipse at least once in your lifetime. Because the moon does not emit its own light and only relies on light reflected from the sun, when it falls in the path of the Earth's shadow from direct sunlight, it is obscured and a lunar eclipse occurs. A total lunar eclipse will occur when the moon passes through the Earth's umbra and can last for as long as 1 hour and 40 minutes because the moon is much smaller than the Earth and therefore takes some time to pass through the Earth's umbra. During a total lunar eclipse, it is still possible to see the moon because a small amount of sunlight reaches it. 
The sunlight is bent or reflected by the atmosphere of the earth and the moon gives a dim coppery color. Or put in another way, during a total lunar eclipse, the sun projects all of the world's sunset and all of the world's sunrise onto the moon at the same time. Back home, you will have to stay up late to watch a lunar eclipse. And if you do, you will see the moon in rare form and will also catch a glimpse of our own Earth's long shadow. So a lunar eclipse occurs when the moon passes through the Earth's shadow, just as a solar eclipse occurs when part of the Earth passes through the moon's shadow. But the moon circles the Earth every month as it circles through its faces, lining up at both full moon and new moon. So why don't eclipses happen twice a month? The reason is that the moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted relative to the Earth's orbit around the Sun by about 5 degrees. So the orbit of the Earth and that of the moon don't lie on the same plane. So although the Earth and the moon always cast long shadows, they rarely shade each other thanks to this orbital tilt. If that is the case, why do eclipses happen at all? Because there are two points where the moon's orbit crosses the sun's plane called nodes. And as the moon moves along its orbit, these points line up with the sun about twice a year. If the moon is between the sun and the earth at this time, we get a solar eclipse. If it's behind the earth at that time, we get a lunar eclipse. Total eclipses occur within the darkest part of the shadow, the umbra. In the lighter part of the shadow, the penumbra, we get partial eclipses. Next is a pinhole camera. The pinhole camera is a simple camera that also provides evidence that light travels in straight lines. It consists of a rectangular box fitted on one end with a screen made of a tracing paper. On the other end is a small pinhole. Light from all parts of an object travels through the pinhole and forms an image on the screen. The image appears upside down and is laterally inverted. This can only be explained if light travels in straight lines. Light from the top of the object strikes the bottom of the image so that the image appears upside down. Light from the right side of the object forms the left side of the image so that the image appears sideways inverted. A pinhole camera forms an image without using lenses or a mirror. We can construct a more flexible pinhole camera by joining two hollow cylindrical boxes of different diameters in such a way that one box can just slide within the other. We then make a small hole in the larger cylinder and again make two small holes in the smaller cylinder. But the inner hole is rectangular and bigger. We now fix a translucent paper, say a tracing paper, on the rectangular hole because that will act as a screen. The two cylinders must be tightly closed to prevent entry of light into the larger cylinder. Now look at the tree with your camera. A clear image of the tree can be seen on the screen. How does that happen? Let's say the tree is MN. Light rays from the bottom of the tree pass through the pinhole and strike the screen at the top, N prime. And light rays from the top of the tree strike the bottom, that is M prime. So we get an inverted and much smaller image. To adjust the size of the image, all you have to do is slide the inner box. And one more thing, the image depends on the size of the pinhole. 
If we add more pinholes, there would be many images formed with overlapping sections, making the image blurred. Increasing the pinhole size is similar to adding many pinholes and the effect is just the same, blurred images. Magnification Now, the change in the size of an image relative to that of the object is called the magnification, represented by M. Therefore, magnification is equal to height of the image over height of the object. It can also be proved from the geometry of similar triangles that magnification is equal to distance of the image from the pinhole V over distance of the object from the pinhole U. And therefore, height of the image over height of the object is equal to distance of the image from the pinhole over the distance of the object from the pinhole. Let's take an example. The length of a pinhole camera box is 15 centimeters. If the screen is 10 centimeters in dimensions, how far should the boy, 1.5 meters tall, stand away from the camera so as to get a full image of the boy? And the solution, the boy's full image means that the image fills the screen in height, that is an image of height 10 centimeters. So we have H1 over H0 is equal to V over U. 150 centimeters, that is 1.5 meters, over 10 centimeters is equal to V over 15 centimeters. Cross multiplication. 10V is equal to 2,250, we divide both sides by 10 and we get V is 225 centimeters. The boy must stand at a distance of 22 and a half meters away from the pinhole camera. Next we look at reflection of light. When light rays strike the boundary of two media such as air and glass, a part of light is turned back into the same medium. This is called reflection of light. A highly polished surface such as a mirror reflects most of the light falling on it. Let's look at definition of terms in reflection of light. The incident ray is the light ray striking a reflecting surface. The point of incidence is the point at which the incident ray strikes the reflecting surface. The normal is a perpendicular drawn to the surface at the point of incidence. The angle of incidence is the angle which the incident ray makes with the normal at the point of incidence. It is denoted by the letter I. The reflected ray is the ray obtained after reflection from the surface in the same medium in which the incident ray is traveling. The angle of reflection is the angle the reflected ray makes with the normal at the point of incidence and it is denoted by letter R. Plane of incidence is the plane containing the incident ray and the normal. The plane of reflection is the plane containing the reflected ray and the normal. Next we look at the laws of reflection and there are two of them. One, the angle of incidence equals to the angle of reflection. And two, the incident ray, the normal to the mirror at the point of incidence, and the reflected ray all lie on the same plane. Now if you look at this experiment, you see that as the angle of incidence increases, so does the angle of reflection. You see the two angles are equal. 
array along the normal or simply perpendicular to the mirror is reflected along the same path or we say it retraces its path. So how would you trace the image of point O reflected on the mirror MM? Now it's simple. Draw any two rays incident to the mirror at different angles from O, say OA and OB. Now OA being perpendicular is reflected along the same path. OB is reflected along BC according to the laws of reflection. Extend the reflected rays AO and BC backwards. The point of intersection is the position of the image. How will the image look like? Now look at this reflection. The height of the man and his image are equal. And this means that the image formed in a plain mirror has the same size as the object. Also, the man's image is as far behind the mirror as the man is in front of the mirror. And this means that the image is as far behind a plain mirror as the object is in front of the mirror. Note that the distances are measured from the mirror. Then, when the man stands upright, his image is upright as well. And this means that the image formed in a plain mirror has the same orientation as the object. Finally, when the man holds the basketball in his right hand, the image holds the ball in his left hand. This means that the image formed in a plane mirror is laterally inverted. So just how is the image formed in a plane mirror? Now the rays hit the mirror and are reflected back. If you extend the reflected rays backwards as we did before, you realize the image of the man cannot be captured on a screen. This means that the image formed on a plain mirror is virtual. The rays only appear to come from there, but they actually don't. And now to the most interesting part, images formed by mirrors at an angle. If an object is placed between two mirrors inclined at an angle, we get more than one images due to multiple reflections of light. The number of images n obtained when two mirrors are inclined at an angle theta is given by the relation n is equal to 360 over n minus 1. If 360 over theta is not a whole number, then the number of images will be found by rounding off to the nearest integer. Let's start with an angle of 120 degrees. When the angle of inclination between two mirrors is 120 degrees, only two images are formed as you can see in the mirror. Mathematically, Let's have a ray diagram. We place two mirrors MM and MM prime in such a way that the angle of inclination between them is 120 degrees. Now place an object O between them. Let OA and OB be the incident rays on the mirror from O. 
OA being perpendicular to the mirror retraces its path. Whereas OB gets reflected along BC according to the laws of reflection. Now extend the reflected rays AO and BC backwards. An image is formed at O1, the point of intersection of the reflected rays. Again let OE and OD be incident on the mirror M M prime. OD retraces its path upon reflection. OE reflected along EF according to the laws of reflection. Once again, extend the reflected rays backwards. The image is formed at O2. So when the inclination angle is 120 degrees, we get two images. How about 90 degrees? Now, when the mirrors are mutually perpendicular to each other, only three images are formed. Mathematically again, and now on a ray diagram. When we place an object O between two perpendicular mirrors, OA and OB are incident to the mirror MM. OA being normal to the surface retraces its path. OB is reflected along BC. Extending the reflected rays, they meet at O1, the position of the first image. OD and OE are incident on the mirror M M prime. OD being normal retraces its path. And OE is reflected along EF. Extending the reflected rays backwards, we get image O2. The reflected ray BC gets reflected internally by the mirror M M prime along CG. The ray CG appears to come from O3, which is the image of O1. Similarly, EF gets reflected internally by the mirror MM along FH. The ray appears to come from O4. O4 and O3 coincide. Therefore, we obtain three images when an object is placed between two mutually perpendicular mirrors. Finally, what about parallel mirrors? Now, when two mirrors are placed parallel to each other, infinite images are formed. Diagrammatically, let MM and M prime M prime be two parallel mirrors. O is placed between them. O O prime represent the incident ray on mirror MM. The ray OA makes an incident angle with the normal and gets reflected according to the laws of reflection. O O prime being normal to the mirror retraces its path. Extending the reflected rays backwards, they meet at I1, which is the virtual image of O. The mirror M prime M prime reflects the ray AB.
extending O M prime and B C backwards, they meet at I two to give a virtual image. Similarly, the images I3 and I4 are formed. Applications of plane mirrors. Now we look at the periscope, and a periscope is an instrument used to view objects over obstacles. It is used in submarines and also to watch over crowds. The images seen with the aid of the instrument are erect and virtual. A simple periscope may be constructed by arranging two plane mirrors inclined at an angle of 45 degrees to the horizontal. The rays from the object are reflected by the top mirror and then reflected again by the bottom mirror into the observer's eye. Now more elaborate periscopes are used in submarines and here prisms are used instead of mirrors and the tube supporting them incorporates a telescope to extend the range of vision. You can make a bigger difference in the world. You can make a positive change in your career. You can make a greater contribution to the greater good. And you can start today by earning your degree online at Walden University, where advanced degrees advance the quality of life.